Hello, and welcome to the second lecture in my series on alcohol. In this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about the pharmacology of alcohol, how it's absorbed in, into the body, how it's broken down and eliminated. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the acute effects that alcohol has on the peripheral and central nervous system. And at the very end, I'm going to talk a little bit about the after effects of drinking, particularly the effects that alcohol has on normal sleep cycles and uh, the phenomenon of hangovers. So let's start with the pharmacology of alcohol. Now obviously alcohol is water soluble, it's consumed in solution with water. It's also somewhat fat soluble and these, uh, two, um, these two features mean that alcohol absorbs quite readily into the body. If you drink alcohol in an empty stomach, a fair amount of it approximately 20% or so, will be absorbed directly from your stomach, and most of the rest of it will be absorbed in your small intestine pretty quickly. Now, what's important uh, about this is that you have an enzyme in your body, it's present in your stomach and also in your liver, called alcohol dehydrogenase. It's uh, important for the first step in the metabolic breakdown of alcohol. Um, and because it exists in your stomach, the more time the alcohol spends in your stomach, the more time it has to be broken down into other compounds before getting absorbed. So anything that you can do, either deliberately or accidentally, to slow or delay uh, alcohol absorbing from your stomach will tend to decrease the effect that their, your alcoholic beverage can have on you because there'll be less alcohol actually absorbing into your bloodstream. So let's see a little bit about how that works. One thing that affects how quickly alcohol absorbs into your body is food. Food, you know, for instance, if you're consuming a meal while drinking a glass of wine or drinking a glass of beer, will tend to slow how quickly the alcohol can get into your system. If you're eating food, your stomach will hold on to that food and begin to digest it for a fair bit of time before passing the food along to your intestines. If alcohol is mixed in with that food, that's more time for the alcohol to be worked on by alcohol dehydrogenase. So basically, more time in the stomach, more time for alcohol to get broken down before it can get into the bloodstream and affect you, less of an effect from the alcohol on your nervous system. So as a bit of advice, and you can take it for what it is, if you're going to drink alcohol, it's good to eat some food with it. It's also good to drink some water with it, but especially to eat some food with it, because it'll help to buffer and indeed to limit the effects that alcohol has on you. It takes longer for alcohol to get absorbed into your bloodstream, and while you're waiting for that to happen, more of the alcohol gets broken down. Another factor that affects how quickly alcohol gets absorbed into your body is carbonation. Now carbonation is clearly present in many of the beverages, many of the alcoholic beverages that we enjoy, things like a rum and coke or a jack and coke or a gin and tonic or even beer. Um, carbonation can irritate your stomach. It's, a, you know, we all have probably had that feeling of drinking too much soda too quickly and having that kind of uncomfortable feeling in our stomach. That irritation triggers the stomach to empty its contents into the intestine. So if you're um, drinking an alcoholic beverage that is carbonated, uh, that carbonation can irritate your stomach, triggering a release into your intestines, which means there's less time in the stomach and less time for alcohol to get broken down. So again, more advice uh, you can take if you want. If you're going to be drinking alcoholic beverages, it's probably good to avoid really fizzy ones, or at least if you're drinking fizzy ones, be aware that uh, they'll tend to get absorbed, or at least the alcohol in them will tend to get absorbed a little bit more quickly than in non-carbonated beverages. Artificial sweeteners, interestingly, uh, speed stomach emptying, or it's probably more accurate to say sugar in beverages slows stomach emptying. So if you're drinking a uh, rum and Diet Coke, the um, mixture of rum and Diet Coke will get into your intestines faster and the alcohol will absorb faster than if you're drinking a regular Coke and uh, rum, so with, as with sugar. Um, so again, if you're drinking um, a uh, Diet Coke and rum beverage or a Diet whatever, an alcohol beverage, there'll be a little bit less time that that beverage will spend in your stomach. It'll move more quickly into your intestines. Less time in your stomach means less time for alcohol to get broken down and potentially a stronger effect of the alcohol in that beverage on you. So 
again, more advice. And uh, I realize in this lecture, I'm, I'm doling out a lot of advice. It just seems like um, it's useful to know, you know, many of you drink alcohol or almost all of you, I'm sure know people who do drink alcohol. Alcohol can be a wonderful drug, at least in some contexts. It can be a terrible drug in many contexts. Having a little bit of knowledge, I think can be helpful. So more knowledge, more advice. Um, if you're going to be drinking uh, mixed beverages, you know, mixed alcoholic drinks like rum and coke or gin and tonic or whatever else, it's probably best to avoid artificial sweeteners because they will, as compared to sugar-based uh, mixers, they'll tend to speed the absorption of alcohol into your system. It's funny when I think back to uh, living in Florida, which is where I used to live before uh, moving up to North Dakota, I remember for a period of time uh, Bacardi rum was advertising on billboards in the town where I lived in Tallahassee, uh, Bacardi um, and Diet Coke. Uh, the, and this was during that whole period of time where everyone was very concerned about eating too many carbs or having too many carbs in their diet. And the, uh, the uh, makers of Bacardi were sort of advertising the fact that if you had rum and Diet Coke, there were relatively few carbs in that beverage. I guess it's lower calorie than probably other options. And that may be true, and I guess that's probably a good idea if you're trying to go on a diet. But um, the, it occurred to me as I looked at this, that sign one day, when I was sort of sitting in my office, that if you're drinking a carbonated beverage, if you're drinking a carbonated beverage that has alcohol and also artificial sweeteners, if you're also on a diet, so you're probably not eating as much food as you normally do, you could be setting yourself up for a situation in which you get very rapid absorption of alcohol into your system and you might get more drunk than you really intend to. So that's something that occurred to me and I, I guess something I'm passing along to you. Um, it's interesting to ask, you know, uh, last time uh, I talked about the idea of a standard drink, a standard drink being a volume of an alcoholic beverage that would provide about you know, a half a fluid ounce of pure alcohol. So a, a shot of uh, liquor, a glass of wine, or a glass of beer, you know, roughly speaking, all contain the same amount of alcohol in them. Um, with that in mind, the question comes up, do, do you get drunk faster if you drink the liquor as compared to drinking the beer? Now, in a sense, it seems like the answer should be no, because they both contain the same amount of alcohol, but probably most of us who've drunk beer or also drunk liquor would have the intuitive feeling that, gosh, if you drink the liquor, you're maybe going to get drunk faster than if you drink the beer. And there is some truth to that. And the truth is that the concentration of alcohol in a beverage has an effect on how quickly the alcohol gets absorbed into your body. Alcohol by itself will tend to irritate the stomach, much like carbonation in a beverage, although more so than carbonation in a beverage. To the extent that your stomach is irritated, it will tend to trigger an emptying effect where the stomach will sort of kick all the food down to the small intestine or kick all the contents of the stomach down to the small intestine, um, which will then leave less time for the alcoholic beverage to be in the stomach, less time for the alcohol in that beverage to be broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase and a faster absorption and a faster effect uh, of that beverage. So a glass of beer, a shot of whiskey have roughly the same amount of alcohol in them. If you drink the beer, you're getting a relatively milder um, experience for your stomach. There's a lot of water there the concentration of alcohol is relatively low, there'll be a somewhat slower absorption of that alcohol. If you have the shot of whiskey, much less water in that whiskey than there is in the beer, relatively speaking, there's a greater chance of irritating your stomach, which may not feel very good anyway. And also as a consequence of that irritation, a greater chance of getting a quick absorption of the alcohol in that whiskey into your bloodstream and you know circulating around to affect your nervous system. So uh, again, you know, more advice that you can draw from this information if you choose is that if you're drinking alcoholic beverages, it's probably best to limit the consumption of liquor that you're having. Even if you're not trying to drink very much, simply drinking liquor, especially not mixed with any anything, especially on an empty stomach, can lead to some irritation, which again, you may not particularly like very much, but can also um, lead you to get drunker faster than you might otherwise want to. So put another way, distilled beverages, liquors, um, you know, whiskeys, rum, vodka, etc. Higher concentration of alcohol relative to their volume, faster emptying of the stomach, faster absorption into the bloodstream. 
non-distilled beverages like beer and wine, especially beer, um, lower concentration of alcohol by volume, slower emptying, slower absorption. So again, different factors in beverages affect the pharmacokinetics of those beverages, how quickly the alcohol absorbs into your system. Another factor that plays a role is gender. And I actually mentioned this way back at the beginning of the semester in one of my earlier lectures, probably one of the lectures on pharmacology. But, um, you know, generally speaking, women have smaller bodies than men. I mean, there's, there's variability both within the genders. Uh, so there are clearly some bigger women and some smaller men. But on average, women are, are smaller, uh, have smaller bodies. On average, they have higher levels of fat in their body. So there's actually less water in terms of their overall size than there is in men. So there's smaller bodies with less water, thus greater uh, concentrations of alcohol can occur within them as compared to men. Women also have less alcohol dehydrogenase in their system than men do, which means that if you had a man and a woman, even if they were the same size, same you know height and weight, you would expect the woman to get drunk a little bit faster than the man because she has a higher uh, sort of fat volume in her body, less water for the alcohol to dissolve into, and also less alcohol dehydrogenase to break down that alcohol than the man does. So. Again, alcohol has a stronger effect on women than on men, even if you try and match the beverage, the amount of beverages that the two genders are, are consuming, and even if you try and match as best as you can the size of the two people, the man and the woman. Um, this has some important consequences. One, you know, if you're a woman and you're drinking alcohol with male uh, companions, your you know, friends or partners or whatever, be aware that they'll be able to drink more than you. And if you try and keep up with them, you may end up more drunk than you want to be. Um, if you're a man and you're drinking with female companions, friends or partners, be aware that they're getting drunker faster than you. And you know, do your best to be responsible both for yourself and for your friends or your companions. So different uh, factors, different variables affect how alcohol absorbs into the body. There are others that I'm actually not going to get into in this lecture. What happens once alcohol gets into the body? Well, it begins to circulate around and affect different parts, uh, different systems, including different parts of your nervous system. I'll talk about that a little bit later. It also starts to get broken down. So your body works to break down and eliminate alcohol almost as soon as you absorb it. A very small amount of alcohol is sweat. Uh, it can be sweated out of your body. Um, you know, sometimes if you go to parties or you know, like dance clubs or even outdoor music festivals, you'll hear people talk about, "Oh, I'm really drunk, but I'm I'm just I'm sweating it all out because I'm dancing so much, or I'm you know, I'm jumping up and down listening to this band play." There's some truth to that. You do lose a little bit of alcohol through your sweat. You can even smell it on people who've been drinking a lot, but not very much. And it's it's hard to, to work out. You know, you couldn't jump on a treadmill and sweat out all the alcohol that you've just consumed if you've had a drink. You similarly lose some amount of alcohol in your breath. Uh, this is why people have that kind of boozy breath if they've been drinking. This is also how alcohol breath testers work. If you've ever had to do one of those uh, during a police traffic stop or for any other reason, it's because about 5% of the alcohol you consume, roughly, uh, will be vaporized in your lungs and will be exhaled when you breathe. Um, but again, most of it doesn't leave your system either in your sweat or in your breath. Most of it has to be broken down. And I'll get to that in a couple more slides. Um, before I do, I'll just briefly note that alcohol is uh, measured in breath alcohol content, which can be estimated different ways. It's often expressed as grams of alcohol per 210 liters of breath, which is a good way as, you know, roughly not more than roughly, is highly correlated with your blood alcohol content, which is normally expressed as grams per 100 milliliters of blood. Um, that's where those numbers come from. You know, the 0.08 legal limit that you've uh, heard about or that I mentioned in the last class uh, for driving, that's 0.08 grams per 100, uh, or per 200 milliliters of blood concentration of alcohol, which can be estimated more or less directly from grams per 210 liters of breath uh, concentration of alcohol. So if you blow a breathalyzer test, it reads 0 0.08, 0 0.10, etc., etc. That's what those numbers refer to. So like I said, uh, most of the alcohol doesn't leave your system by being sweated out or, or sort of breathed out. Most of it actually has to be broken down by your body. 
I already mentioned the first step of this process. It's where alcohol is broken down to acetaldehyde by an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase or ADH. Now some of this enzyme is present in your stomach. So like I mentioned before, if alcoholic beverages linger in your stomach for a while, you know, because you've been eating food or, 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 it's, or so on, uh, that's more time for the alcohol dehydrogenase in your stomach to have a first crack at breaking down the alcohol before it can even circulate into your blood. Um, once it's circulating in your blood, the alcohol dehydrogenase in your liver uh, you know, intercepts the alcohol molecules and begins to break them down into acetaldehyde. Now acetaldehyde is an interesting substance. It's toxic to your body and some of the effects that we associate with a hangover, some of the, the pain and the nausea and the kind of muscle weakness probably have to do with the acute effects of acetaldehyde in your system. It's, it's bad stuff for you. Um, there's some evidence that the long-term risks of heavy alcohol consumption, including increased risk of cancer, is because the, you know, there's wear and tear on your body if you drink heavily, you know, you're drinking every day, you're drinking a lot, and there's just a lot of acetaldehyde circulating in your system, damaging the tissues of your body. Um, also, as a side note, um, acetaldehyde, as we'll see in the next slide, is broken down into further uh, met you know, sort of metabolites of alcohol. And part of that breakdown process is improved if you have um, vitamin C or vitamin B1 or other antioxidants in your system. So taking a multivitamin after you've been drinking won't guarantee that you won't get a hangover, but it may help. So as a general bit of advice, um, if you've been drinking Hopefully you were eating some food too to get some nutrition in your system. Um, if you weren't, it might be worth taking that multivitamin. It'll help the metabolism of alcohol. Like I said, acetaldehyde gets broken down. It gets broken down fairly quickly by another enzyme called acetaldehyde dehydrogenase or ALDH2. Um, it's, this also occurs in your liver and acetaldehyde gets broken down into acetic acid. Now, I mentioned in the last class that there's a, uh, a reaction that's associated with folks who have uh, ancestry from the Pacific Rim of Asia. Um, some folks, you know, folks who are, trace their ancestry to China or to Japan especially, when they drink alcohol will have a really strong, uh, what's called a flushing reaction. Your face will turn really red. They may feel dizzy or even nauseous. Um, I had a friend in, uh, in college who was a roommate of mine who was, um, you know, by, by ethnicity was Chinese. And when he would drink one or two beers, he would very quickly turn as red as a beet and feel quite sick. This is because those folks have a gene for a version of ADLH, uh, ALDH2 that is less efficient than the version of ALDH2 that most other folks have. So when they drink alcohol, their body isn't as good, or, or I should say isn't as quick at breaking down acetaldehyde as most other people's body. And again, because acetaldehyde is toxic to your body, uh, it lingers in your system, creates this kind of uh, sort of inflammation in your tissues, which you can observe in the face and which people can subjectively experience. Um, you know, this is an unpleasant sensation for most folks who have it. So a lot of folks who have this reaction tend to not drink or at least not drink very much. It can offer some kind of protective uh, effect against becoming a heavy drinker and having alcohol problems. That said, there are plenty of Asian people, including, including folks who have this reaction, who just kind of push through it and keep on drinking despite the flushing reaction. Um, again, it, it used to be thought that folks who were Native American, because you know, in distant past, their ancestry also traces to Asia, uh, might also have this reaction, which might explain some of the um, increased incidence of alcohol problems associated with being Native American. Um, there's not a lot of evidence, though, that folks who are Native American have this version of the ALDH2 gene, at least not in recent research that I've read. Um, other interesting thing that kind of goes along with this step in the, uh, in the metabolic process is the effects of a drug called disulfiram, or more commonly known as antabuse. Um, the, this drug blocks acetaldehyde metabolism. So if you're, a, uh, if you're someone who drinks alcohol and you're trying to quit alcohol, you take one of these pills every day and it uh, blocks the metabolism of acetaldehyde, which does you no harm until you drink alcohol. 
if you drink alcohol, then your body gets really inefficient at breaking down acetaldehyde and you get pretty sick. You have a big flushing reaction. You feel really nauseous and dizzy and it hopefully discourages you from drinking. So again, some folks who are uh, heavy drinkers, they're really desperate to quit, will take this drug as kind of a preventative because it produces such a punishing effect on them when they drink that they are disinclined to drink or it helps them avoid drinking. Uh, the only flaw in this treatment approach is it depends upon the person to dutifully take, <coughs> pardon me, dutifully take his or her antabuse every day. If you don't do it, you get you know, you can get to escape the effects of the sickness. So someone who's has a real uh, alcohol dependence, who's really addicted to alcohol, might cheat by not taking their drug on a day that they're planning to drink. However, for those folks who can stick with the program, it can be an effective way to uh, decrease uh, alcohol consumption and to ultimately help uh, cure yourself or get over uh, alcohol addiction. Anyway, as, as I said a couple slides ago, uh, acetaldehyde is broken down into acetic acid. You probably recognize that as just common vinegar, which is clearly non-toxic for the body. And then in a couple more steps that occur afterwards, acetic acid is broken down into water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and some energy. There are calories in alcohol. Alcohol is fairly calorific. It's not particularly nutritious otherwise, but your body gets energy from metabolizing alcohol. So uh, again, if you're really on a diet, you're trying to lose weight, or at least for whatever reason, limit your calorie intake, it's good to just limit your alcohol because it's just empty calories for your body. So this whole process has some different steps and I think it's interesting to know a little bit about those steps because it tells us a little bit about why some people have, for instance, a flushing reaction to alcohol. It tells us a little bit about, about why a drug like antabuse works the way it does. Um, it's also good to understand this process because once you do, you understand that getting drunk, that is drinking enough alcohol to feel drunk, is basically like engaging in a race between your behavior and your body's metabolic process. You know, if you can drink faster than your body can metabolize alcohol, you'll feel drunk. If you drink more slowly than your body metabolizes alcohol, you don't get particularly drunk at all. And there is some variability um, in this, uh, you know, in this relationship as a function of your gender. As I mentioned earlier, men metabolize alcohol a little bit faster than women. And as your body size, you know, if you're a big person, you have a greater volume of water in your body. And it, it, it's, there's essentially more water in you that the alcohol can dissolve into versus if you're a very small person. But generally speaking, the rate of metabolism is fairly stable across people. And it works out to about 0.3 to 0.5 fluid ounces of pure alcohol metabolized per hour. So if we want to be really rough about this, we can say that your body gets rid of about one drink's worth of alcohol, one standard drink's worth of alcohol per hour. You know, if you began an hour you know, drinking a, a, you know, a glass of beer or even taking a shot of whiskey, and you either made that drink last the whole hour, or you had the drink and then didn't drink any other alcoholic beverages for the rest of that hour, assuming you were a normal sized adult and otherwise fairly healthy, you probably wouldn't get very drunk because about as quick as you can put that alcohol into your system, your body is getting rid of it. Of course, many people, most people probably, if they are planning to drink alcohol, if they're going out drinking with their friends at the bar or the restaurant, they're trying to get drunk, so they're essentially speeding up their behavior relative to their metabolism. So instead of having one drink every hour and just sipping at it, they have two. Well, two drinks is enough to beat your metabolism, and you'll start to build up some alcohol in your system, and you'll start to subjectively feel drunk. If you drink three drinks an hour, more so. If you drink five drinks an hour, if you're having a binge, you're going to get really drunk because you're putting alcohol into your system much faster than your body can get rid of it. That basic equation or that basic idea of getting rid of about a drink an hour is I think really useful if you're planning to go drinking with your friends or I guess even drinking by yourself because you can plan time to not get too drunk and to sober up once you already are drunk if you indeed get drunk. Speaking of which, I think it's interesting to take a look at these type of tables, which you can see online and you know, in many textbooks. These are tables that relate um, how heavy you are as a proxy for how much water is in your body and how many drinks you can have before you hit a certain level of intoxication. And 
there's one slide here for women and the next one which I'll slide to in a second is for men. So you can see here if you're a woman you can find approximately how much you weigh and you can see that if you have one drink, two drinks, three drinks, um, how drunk you will get. Now these, uh, these charts don't really account for how quickly you're drinking the alcohol um, which is a little bit of a flaw. You know again if you drank three drinks but it took you three hours to drink them you wouldn't get very drunk at all. But assuming you drink let's say you're 140 pounds and you drink three drinks in an hour or maybe a little bit more than an hour. You might reasonably expect to get to a blood alcohol level of 0.10, which is well above legal limit and is actually quite drunk. So knowing these charts or having a rough sense of where you are on this chart can be handy, again, if you're going out drinking with your friends or if you're drinking by yourself, because you can basically plan to get as drunk as you want to be or as you feel you can safely be. So here's the chart for men and it's, it's slightly different because again men uh, you know tend to metabolize alcohol a little bit more quickly. Um, you know I weigh uh, just slightly over 200 pounds and so if I sit down and have about three drinks or so at, you know at a bar maybe I have a, a pint of the craft beer so that's a, almost two drinks and then maybe I have a half pint so I'm at about three drinks. If I have those two drinks within about an hour's time or maybe a little bit more than an hour I'm already in that shaded region of being near the legal limit for driving or even at the legal limit for driving which is quite drunk and also and we'll get to this in another slide uh, another um, lecture I think you can be quite impaired even if you're below the legal limit for driving so you know I, I wouldn't encourage anyone to get behind the wheel even if they're not quite at 0.08 a level of intoxication. Again, more advice that you can take or, or, or not take, um, I would encourage you to kind of think about these type of uh, charts. You can easily find them online. Uh, they're all about the same, but if you kind of memorize where you are on the chart, it's helpful for you if you're thinking about drinking alcohol, uh, again, with your friends or, or even just on your own. Like I said before, um, you can get rid of about one drink per hour. Roughly speaking, this corresponds to dropping about 0.01 level of intoxication per hour. So you know if you if you got as drunk as uh, you know 0.08, you know legal limit for driving, it's going to be quite a few hours before you're really sober. Um, your body breaks down alcohol slowly. Um, the reason it breaks down alcohol slowly is because there's just a limited amount of alcohol dehydrogenase in your body. Um, I mentioned in a much earlier lecture that we sometimes talk about the metabolism of, of alcohol as having the quality of zero order kinetics, meaning that the rate at which you break down alcohol is basically limited by your level of alcohol dehydrogenase and you can't do much, at least in the immediate time, to change that. You can't give yourself more alcohol dehydrogenase magically. Um, you know, your body gets rid of about one drink per hour roughly speaking worth of worth of alcohol and you can't do much to speed it up or slow it down you know occasionally you'll hear people say things like you know if you if you are again at a, at a dance club or a music festival like oh you know just dance really hard and you'll kind of you'll burn the alcohol out of your system um, that doesn't really work you may feel more alert because you're moving your body around but you're still just as drunk uh, other things like drinking caf uh, caffeinated beverages or using stimulants like cocaine make you feel less drunk at least in the sense that you're more alert and more active but you're actually no uh, less drunk than you were before so you can't really speed up the process no matter what you try um, and again, as a, a bit of advice, just keep in mind if you're drinking uh, with your friends or on your own, once you're getting drunk, your body can get rid of about one drink per hour. So if you've had about four, it's going to take you upwards of four hours to be totally sober afterwards, uh, depending on how quickly you had those four drinks. Okay, with all that in mind, let's think about the acute effects of alcohol. What goes on in your body? What goes on in your brain when you consume alcoholic beverages? Well, in the peripheral nervous system, alcohol acts primarily as a depressant. Uh, and the way we think about that is it tends to uh, increase parasympathetic activity. It tends to decrease sympathetic activity. It sort of slows you down in different ways. Um, you know, like this little guy here, he had a couple beers and he just fell asleep. Um, it's also worth noting that when we're, uh, you know, when you're drinking alcohol, there are some stimulant effects of alcohol. 
You, know, you, uh, you can feel a little bit of increased energy if you're drinking, and even some changes in your mood that kind of go, coincide with that, like increased positive mood. But these tend to occur at low doses of alcohol or early in the drinking period. So just as you're transitioning your body from being sober to being a little bit drunk, that's where you catch most of the buzz associated with drinking. So people talk about getting a buzz from beer. It's usually that first drink or so, or you know, you feel kind of giddy because you had a shot of whiskey. Well, it's usually that first drink or so that's getting you some of those relatively more pleasant feelings. At higher doses of alcohol and later in the drinking period when you've been drinking for a while, the effects of alcohol look much more like a depressant drug. And often, although not always, but often the subjective emotional experience that goes along with that is more depressant or, or dysphoric. Um, a bit of advice to take from this is that the pleasant feelings that come from drinking come from low doses of, of alcohol, which is good news, kind of. It's, it means that if you like to drink alcohol, good for you. You can probably get most of the feelings that you like from it without having to drink very much, which is good because that's healthier and safer for you probably to do. Another thing that goes along with this, another idea that goes along with this, is the way that people get themselves into trouble with drinking where as they begin to drink, they start to feel a little bit more euphoric. That is to say, they start to feel more energetic and have more of a positive emotion. Um, you can see here this kind of lazy S or sinusoidal graph describing the change over time from initial rise in positive feelings to a kind of a shift over into uh, negative or depressive feelings. Um, you get that initial shift early on in the drinking period and at lower levels of alcohol. It's tempting to imagine that what's going to happen is you'll have a, a constantly increasing uh, effect of alcohol, kind of like this, the uh, a straight line here, you know, what the graph calls the cultural myth about alcohol. If one drink makes me feel a little bit good, two drinks will make me feel even better, four drinks will make me feel even better than that. It's easy to get caught up in that mentality when you're drinking, uh, when the reality is the more you drink, the closer you put yourself to the, the shift in the curve, where all of a sudden what was a good feeling and a kind of an energetic feeling from alcohol becomes a kind of a negative and depressive and kind of sedating feeling from alcohol. So uh, fundamentally, alcohol's effects on the emotions and on your overall level of physical activity are kind of biphasic, meaning there's a positive phase and a negative phase, or two phases, biphasic. Although we often as drinkers don't realize that. We think that, gosh, I'm just gonna keep drinking and keep feeling better. But if you really think about it and you think back to previous experiences you maybe had, you know that after a couple drinks, it's diminishing returns. And then it's worse than diminishing returns. It's you get, kind of in a negative space emotionally and maybe you feel really tired and run down in terms of your just your body uh, it's best to focus on drinking a little rather than drinking a lot and it's not just good to focus on drinking a little rather than drinking a lot in terms of your emotional tone and kind of how you feel about the whole experience but also because higher doses of alcohol tend to have some unpleasant effects in your periphery. They tend to increase, or I'm sorry, decrease your respiration rate. That's you know not entirely occurring in your peripheral nervous system. That's partly occurring in your central nervous system as your your brainstem and your hindbrain signal your heart and signal your lungs to beat and to breathe. Also, at higher doses of alcohol, you can have both vomiting as your body tries to get rid of what's left of the alcohol in the stomach, and also, unfortunately, a decrease in the gag reflex. So you occasionally hear about people dying from alcohol poisoning. What happened is they you know, threw up, but then if they were asleep, aspirated or inhaled some of their vomit and choked on their vomit and died. You know, there are examples of famous musicians who've died this way. There are countless examples of just common people who've died this way. It's because alcohol tends to both trigger a kind of a toxic response where you you throw up, but also, and unfortunately, can inhibit your gag reflex, making it more likely that you could accidentally choke to death on your own vomit, uh, which is disgusting and tragic. A um, little bit of advice here, uh, if you are around someone who's really intoxicated, uh, if you're hanging out with a friend who drinks too much and he sort of is falling asleep or passing out, try to make sure that that person lies on his or her side, um, so that if they do throw up, there's less of a chance of the vomit getting stuck in their windpipe and choking them. Um, again, it's try to be responsible for your own behavior. Try to be responsible for your friends too if you're using alcohol. 
Other stuff that can happen when you drink, uh, this table is a little bit fussy. There's a lot of uh, text on it, of course, but it does give you a sense of the kind of the, the shift in effects that occur across a variety of different uh, dimensions as you drink alcohol. You know, at low levels of alcohol intoxication, you know, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, maybe about as drunk as you would get off one or two drinks, you notice there are things like a feeling of well-being, a sense of warmth, um, at 0.03 or 0.04, which again roughly is maybe about as drunk as you get off of three drinks. It's feelings of relaxation or exhilaration and happiness, mostly good stuff. But as you, you notice, as the level of intoxication goes up, things get bad. You know, at, at about the level of 0.08, which is the legal limit for driving, we have uh, feelings of numbness, uh, decreased reaction time, um, you know, further up deterioration of motor coordination. And you don't actually have to get all that drunk to be at a fairly lethal level of intoxication. At levels of 0.30 or 0.40, people can be profoundly stupefied. They can go unconscious, which can be dangerous. They can have decreased respiration and uh, may even have you know, erratic heart rate. Um, levels of intoxication about at about 0.4 or 0.5, which is again, well, well above legal limit. But you know, people can get this drunk. Um, you is uh, roughly lethal dose 50 for humans, meaning about approximately half of people who get that drunk will literally die from being intoxicated. Um, there's variability. People who've been drinking heavily for a long period of time can grow quite tolerant to alcohol, so they're able to, to keep going at high levels of intoxication. But it's worth noting that alcohol is a fairly toxic drug. You, know, you can overdose and die on it. Um, and I don't say that to scare people or to sound overly scolding about drinking. I myself enjoy drinking alcohol, um, but it is really worth reminding yourself that although alcohol is a legal drug, you can literally kill yourself with it. And um, hopefully that inspires a certain level of respect and caution around how you choose to drink. Elsewhere in the peripheral nervous system, or kind of in the periphery of the body, uh, alcohol acts as a peripheral dilator, meaning it tends to cause your blood vessels to expand in size. Um, this can contribute to the flushing reaction, both the really acute flushing reaction that Asian folks sometimes have, or just the general flushing reaction that most people have. If you see someone who's drinking a lot, they'll often have the kind of red look in their face or their hands will feel warm. That's because their body is, um, you know, their blood vessels are expanding, more blood is circulating near the surface of their skin, and they're actually losing more heat to the environment. Um, this has some important consequences, at least around here in North Dakota, at least in the wintertime. If you're outside and you're drinking alcohol, like if you go out hunting or go out fishing and you're drinking, you may feel warm because your body is kind of, uh, you know, is, is circulating a lot of blood and the surface of your skin feels warm, your hands feel warm, your feet feel warm. That's a nice feeling, of course. That's maybe part of the reason why people like to drink when they're out in the cold. However, it can mean that your body is losing heat faster than otherwise would. You may be tempted to strip down and take off your parka or your hat or your gloves. That's a bad idea if you're in really cold weather. You should be, uh, should be careful about that. Okay, let's move into the central nervous system. And here, alcohol does a lot of different things. Alcohol affects a lot of different systems in the brain, and it does so in different ways. Um, one neurotransmitter system it influences is the uh, gamma aminobutyric acid systems, or the GABA systems. GABA is, generally speaking, an inhibitory neurotransmitter, meaning that around in different systems of the central, in different subsystems within the central nervous system that use GABA, often the presence of GABA inhibits or decreases activity. It kind of acts like a break to many systems within the brain. Alcohol binds to GABA receptors and triggers them such that they decrease the activity in the downstream systems for them. So part of the reason why alcohol acts as a central nervous system depressant is it's a powerful agonist for gamma aminobutyric acid receptors, at least in many parts of the central nervous system. It binds with them and kind of applies the brakes to different uh, parts of your nervous system. 
Another neurotransmitter that, uh, that uh, alcohol affects is the glutamate system. Glutamate is almost like the opposite of GABA. Glutamate is generally an excitatory neurotransmitter, meaning that when it is present, it tends to jack up or increase the activity of different brain systems that use it. Alcohol blocks uh, a particular um, subset of glutamate receptors. So it kind of, um, it, it, you know, the effect is like if GABA or if uh, GABA is the brakes, glutamate is the gas, and alcohol kind of blocks your ability or slows your ability to stomp on the gas, which further decreases the activity of different brain systems. So what's, how does this play out? How does this affect different parts of the brain? Well, we've talked about this in previous lectures, but uh, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, um, if we look in the hindbrain or kind of the lower, you know, the brain stem of, uh, of, your, of your central nervous system, areas like the cerebellum are affected such that uh, the cerebellum is less active, it's less able to do what it's supposed to do. So a person who's drunk will tend to lose motor coordination, they'll stumble, they'll slur their words. Elsewhere in the hindbrain, in the medulla, an area of the brain that governs a lot of your autonomic functioning, there'll be decreased respiration rate and a decrease in the gag reflex. So if someone is, uh, you know, uh, is drinking a lot of alcohol, they may more easily um, slip into a state where they're not breathing deeply, their heart isn't beating steadily, and they may also lose that gag reflex. So if they accidentally throw up, they may more easily choke. Um, moving a little bit further forward, the hypothalamus, not really in the hindbrain, we're kind of getting more into the forebrain uh, right now in the limbic system, kind of in the area between the midbrain and the forebrain. Um, the hypothalamus, among its other functions, has a lot to do with your level of metabolic functioning and your kind of your level of hunger and thirst. Uh, alcohol actually interestingly affects the hypothalamus such that you tend to feel more hungry and more thirsty. So it kind of takes some of the functioning of the hypothalamus and messes it up. So one of the reasons people tend to like to eat and drink at the same time is that alcohol kind of stimulates hunger. It certainly stimulates thirst, which is nice, except if you keep on drinking alcoholic beverages, you can get caught in a cycle where you keep drinking more, but you keep getting more thirsty. And as we'll see in later slides, you get more and more dehydrated. Elsewhere in the forebrain, we have another uh, 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 part of the limbic system, that's the amygdala. The amygdala controls a lot of different aspects of emotionality, including fear. And there's plenty of research to suggest, including some research I did when I was in grad school, that high levels of, of alcohol can decrease the activity of the uh, amygdala, which may explain why people who drink a lot can sometimes be kind of fearless about doing dangerous behavior, like picking a fight at a bar or driving when of course they should be fearful about driving if they're drunk. That fear system is not as responsive under high levels of intoxication. Also in the forebrain, part of the limbic system is the hippocampus. As we've discussed previously, the hippocampus is important for consolidating uh, long-term memory. So taking information that you have in short-term or working memory and storing it uh, in your long-term memory. Um, if you decrease the activity in the hippocampus, you can have impaired memory for events that have happened or even full-on blackouts where you just lose time for uh, what's going on or you, know, you lose time or lose recollection of what you were doing during the time when you were very intoxicated. Moving forward into the forebrain, we of course have the cortex, which is this very large portion of the brain that we, we often think of when we think of the brain. The cortex does all sorts of stuff. Um, in general, we could say, well, it does a lot of your thinking, <laughs> though that's a pretty a pretty uh, slim definition or slim explanation of the cortex's activities. Um, the frontal regions of the cortex, especially the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, are especially important for planning and engaging in good behavioral regulation, choosing the right option and not the wrong option in different uh, at different decision points in your life. To the extent that alcohol impairs the cortex, especially the frontal regions of the cortex, we see people do stupid things or do things that they later regret because the parts of their brain that handle regulating behavior and making those smart decisions just aren't working as well as they would otherwise be if the person wasn't intoxicated. And this may explain some of the stimulant effects that we associate with alcohol. At a very basic level, alcohol just kind of, at least at low doses, will sort of increase 
people's overall level of behavioral activity, but at low and medium and indeed at high doses, the alcohol will impair the activity of the frontal regions of the cortex, which may lead people to behave in kind of impulsive ways, not necessarily like a stimulant effect, but just in a, the effect that they're just doing things that are kind of stupid or reckless. Um, which is, as I think probably many of us know from our own experiences or maybe the experiences of observing our friends or people who are drinking a lot. You see people who are drunk doing stupid stuff and it's because their cortex, especially their frontal region, isn't working as well as it should. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff about what goes on in the, uh, the central nervous system. Um, let's move on and uh, talk a little bit about what happens after you're done drinking. So what are some of the after effects of drinking? What are the after effects that alcohol has on your body? Well, one thing alcohol does is it disrupts your sleep. And this is unfortunate because I think many people uh, like to drink alcohol because it relaxes them and maybe even use alcohol as a way of feeling more sleepy at night, you know, having a nightcap or having a drink right before going to bed so as to ease themselves into sleep. That's true that because alcohol is a depressant, it will tend to slow you down and make you feel sleepy, but it's also true that alcohol will, uh, in, you know, will reduce the quality of the sleep that you actually have. So when we look at people's uh, natural sleep cycles, that is the change in activity level, it changes in activity level that their brain goes through over the course of a night, uh, we see that there's a disruption of sleep cycle as a result of alcohol use. So if we're measuring electroencephalogram or EEG, that is brain waves, or if we're looking at uh, the incidence of rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep, we see that people who've drunk alcohol and then gone to sleep often have decreased REM uh, frequency in their sleep and also have other changes in their sleep cycle that uh, make their sleep less restful. So often uh, if someone's gone to bed after drinking and maybe they're a little bit drunk when they went to sleep, they wake up in the morning feeling like they didn't get much rest even if they were asleep for six, seven, eight hours of time. Um, another problem that can happen is if you go to bed after drinking, if you go to bed when you're still a little bit drunk, you can have a rebound effect which can occur in the early morning hours uh, as your body finally gets rid of the alcohol in your system. You know, keep in mind that as alcohol is in your system, producing, generally speaking, this depressant effect, your body is fighting against it by trying to elevate your, body, your, your body's level of arousal. And now once alcohol has cleared your system, you no longer have this depressant effect and this arousing uh, counterforce, this opponent process is still going and that can lead you to wake up um, often early in the morning feeling kind of restless, sometimes even feeling a little bit hot or uncomfortable and wondering why you can't get back to sleep. Well, it's because your body is kind of overreacting or the reaction that's made to your alcohol is persisting even after the alcohol has left your system. So one way or the other, either because of disrupted sleep cycle or because of the rebound associated with the opponent processes that fight against alcohol when you're drunk, your sleep is usually pretty bad if you've been drinking alcohol. So uh, as a bit of advice, alcohol can help you fall asleep, but it tends to lead to bad quality sleep. So it's not a very good choice if you're trying to relax at nighttime. Also, if you are taking any medication for sleep, like sleep uh, uh, aids like Ambien or, or, um, or other uh, prescription medications, please don't drink with them because often there can be some pretty severe interactions between alcohol and sedatives or tranquilizers. Okay. Another uh, after effect of drinking, uh, after effect of alcohol, is often the hangover. I'm sure many of you who consume alcohol know what a hangover is like. Um, if you drink alcohol for long enough, you're almost certainly going to get one of these. If you've never had a hangover, consider yourself lucky, but also uh, consider that what we're talking about here is a syndrome, a collection of symptoms that can include things like headache, uh, fatigue from loss of sleep, low blood sugar, dehydration, gastrointestinal distress, and some other stuff that I'll talk about in the next couple slides. So what are the uh, symptoms of a hangover? Well, one of them is fatigue, um, like I mentioned already, and as you would know from the previous discussion about alcohol's effects on sleep, a lot of what we're dealing with with the fatigue of hangover is just the consequences of poor sleep 
If you were up late with your friends drinking, then you're probably up later than you otherwise would normally be. And if you're drinking, you probably didn't sleep as well as you otherwise would normally sleep. And that's going to leave you feeling fatigued the next day. Another symptom is weakness. Uh, by this, I mean kind of an impaired, kind of weak, achy feeling in your muscles, maybe a bit like having a case of the flu. Um, alcohol produces some energy. There's a caloric uh, value to alcohol, but it also can impair metabolism of, uh, other, of other energy sources. So, um, you know, if you're drinking alcohol, you're probably not getting enough nutrition. You're probably not eating enough food, and you can wake up the next morning a bit hungry, have low blood sugar. You may also have low levels of electrolytes if you've urinated a lot, as you probably have if you've been drinking alcohol. So it's going to leave you with kind of a weak, achy feeling. Um, the best thing you can do for this is just try to rest um, and maybe eat some food to help out a little bit. Another symptom associated with hangover is thirst. You know, alcohol is a diuretic. It causes people to lose a lot of water. So you know this, of course, if you've ever drunk alcohol, it tends to make you have to go to the bathroom quite a bit. As you pee out all that water, you're also losing uh, basic electrolytes, which is going to leave you feeling thirsty and can also contribute to that kind of weak, uh, achy feeling that I described on the previous slide. Another symptom is nausea. Uh, this can be due to leftover alcohol in your stomach or just to the effects of all the irritation on your stomach that alcohol has caused the night before or whenever you were drinking. So a thirsty, upset stomach, it can be difficult to drink enough water if your stomach feels upset, which can further exacerbate your dehydration. Um, a bit of advice here for those who want to take it is when you're drinking alcohol, it's worth alternating alcoholic beverages and non-alcoholic beverages, ideally water. Um, it's much easier to prevent dehydration from drinking than it is to fix dehydration from drinking. Once you're dehydrated and you feel really thirsty and kind of weak and headachy, it's hard to quickly drink enough water to make those feelings go away, especially if your stomach is feeling upset. So, um, you know, like the old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of, of cure. That's definitely true for hangovers. It's best to avoid getting as dehydrated as you often get when you drink by alternating or mixing in some non-alcoholic beverages during your drinking session. Nausea is just really one of several symptoms like headache uh, that probably also have to do with the presence of acetaldehyde in your system. Recall that acetaldehyde is one of the metabolites that's produced uh, when your body metabolizes alcohol. It's normally uh, metabolized further to acetic acid and then ultimately to water and carbon dioxide and oxygen. Um, However, there's going to be a period of time when acetaldehyde is lingering in your body uh, and it's a toxic uh, substance. It makes you feel sick. It'll give you a headache. It'll make you feel nauseous. There are other compounds that are present in alcoholic beverages as well. Non-ethanol alcohols can sometimes be present. Um, other just large organic molecules, which we collectively call congeners, are present in a lot of alcoholic beverages. Um, these uh, tend to be more uh, present or more um, concentrated in dark beverages, so like dark liquor, like bourbon or rye, as compared to light liquor, like vodka, um, dark wines, like red wine, as compared to white wine, and even dark beer, as compared to, to uh, light-colored light beer. Um, collectively, these compounds, along with acetaldehyde, tend to make you feel kind of sick because they're mildly toxic for your body. Not enough to really kill you or, or hurt you that badly, at least not in the short run, um, but enough to make you feel uh, pretty unpleasant. A bit of advice then is to limit your consumption of dark colored liquors especially, but also things like red wine and even dark uh, beers. Um, you know, many people who drink alcoholic beverages, myself included, enjoy uh, dark liquors and dark beer and red wine. These are some of my favorite beverages, at least my favorite alcoholic beverages. But uh, these days, when I drink them, I have to be really careful because a little bit too much red wine makes me feel headachy. And uh, that's, in essence, uh, one of the symptoms of a hangover. And the older I get, the more sensitive it seems that I'm getting to, to those symptoms. So I have to be a little bit careful. And you should be careful too. So assuming you have a hangover, what can you do about it? 
Well, there are a lot of hangover cures that you can see advertised on the internet or sometimes at gas stations or in, even in pharmacies, and really none of them work. Uh, most of them are some combination of fizzy beverage or you know carbonation like Alka-Seltzer and some sort of uh, painkiller like an analgesic. Uh, a thing to note here though is that um, some of these uh, products contain acetaminophen which is the analgesic in Tylenol. Uh, that's a fairly bad thing to consume if you're also consuming alcohol. There's a, a it puts a fairly heavy strain on your liver. Um, other painkillers like aspirin and ibuprofen don't have this problem so much, but they, like acetaminophen, will all just tend to make your stomach feel kind of upset if it's already feeling upset. Uh, acetaminophen, though, is quite dangerous for your stomach, so if you're drinking, don't take Tylenol, don't take painkillers or hangover cures that contain acetaminophen because it's, it's dangerous. Um, beyond being dangerous, none of these uh, have any demonstrated efficacy. You sometimes hear people say uh, that the cure for a hangover is the hair of the dog that bit you, meaning if you got a hangover from drinking too much beer, have a beer. If you got a, drink over, uh, a hangover from drinking too much tequila, have a shot of tequila. Um, this may make you feel a little bit better, at least in so much as feeling drunk, if you, if you drink enough to get drunk again, will take the edge off some of the pain, but it's just clearly postponing the inevitable. You're just getting more dehydrated and you'll eventually have a worse hangover. Um, I've heard students over the years describe THC, the uh, well, one of the active cannabinoids in marijuana, as a total hangover cure, THC, get it? Um, that makes some sense to me. Uh, marijuana is a, a fairly good um, treatment for nausea, it's a fairly good treatment for pain, and it helps you feel relaxed and comfortable. So it kind of makes sense that smoking pot if you're hungover could help. Uh, that being said, I've never tried it. I can't in any good conscience advise you to try that, but it's something I've heard, and I'm sure there's no active research on it right now, although who knows, one day if marijuana laws liberalize and if uh, more research is done on marijuana, it may be uh, advertised as an effective cure. I don't know, uh, but it's something I've heard. Basic advice that I would give is just do the things that you know you should do. Try and eat a little bit of food, try and drink a little bit of water or a sports beverage, and just try and relax. The hangover will go away, your pain will leave you, the nausea will subside. Uh, I guess the best thing you can do with a hangover is take it as a lesson to be a little bit more careful about your drinking uh, so that next time you don't have a hangover. But that's the last bit of advice I'll give you, and uh, I'm pa I appreciate your patience with all the other advice I've thrown into this lecture. So what's up for next time? Well, next time I'm going to talk about the acute, um, some of the acute behavioral effects of alcohol that I didn't really get to this time. I'm going to talk about the chronic effects of alcohol. Um, I'm going to talk about alcohol use disorders and some of the treatments that are associated with alcohol use disorders. But for now. Uh, that's all I have for today's lecture. Thanks so much for your attention. As I always say, um, I really do appreciate it. If you have questions or comments, uh, put them in the comment section of YouTube. Put them in the discussion boards on Blackboard. I do try and read all those comments and respond to them as best I can. Um, again, thanks for your attention. If you have the chance, take a step away from the uh, computer. Try and relax a little bit. Um, you'll probably feel a lot better, and then when you're ready, come back for the last lecture in my series on alcohol. All right, thanks so much. Bye-bye, guys.